Okay, so now we're going to explore the Who Is data set that's available to us inside of the Community Edition. Who Is is essentially it's it's almost similar to that that uh, that phone book uh, example that I used previously, where mm -hmm. um, if you think of the DNS system as the the domains kind of are the people you're looking up, and the IP addresses are kind of like the phone number. Mm -hmm. um, the Who Is service is kind of like it tells you a bit more about the person who registered the domain. Uh, and so who is, depending on the registrar that you're going through, uh, the, the way in which they request information from you may be different. But for the most part, registrars are going to require an email, a name, an organization, a phone number, and some location information about you yourself, the person mm -hmm. who's registering the domain. Depending on the registrar and the restrictions that they have set up, uh, you may have to put in legitimate information where you actually have to send a copy of your identification to the registrar to validate mm -hmm. who you are. Uh, but more often than not, you can put in any information you want. Uh, and so who is typically um, is valuable for understanding maybe who registered the, registered the domain, but keep in mind that it may not always be accurate. Now, the two things to keep in mind here that even when the data is not necessarily accurate or even complete, is that the email address and the phone number associated with the record typically have to be legitimate. And I mean legitimate in the sense that they have to be reachable. The registrar has to be able to send an email to you or they need to be able to call you up through a phone number and validate who you are and that you have a presence. Mm -hmm. Now, how we use this to our advantage from an analyst perspective is that we can look at the Whois record. In this case, we're looking at PassiveTotal.org's record. And we can see here that we can actually identify the information. And so we have a unique email address. We have the name of our CEO for the company. We have our organization specified in so the record So this is not itself. private. This is not private information. This is not what they call privacy protected. No, this is completely yeah. public. Anybody can see it. And in fact, that is our phone number for the business. Mm -hmm. But you do raise an interesting point. There is the concept of privacy protection. Yeah, and in the past, it was privacy protected when it first started. Yeah, so much like all the other data sets that RiskIQ has, we retain a history and so what we were just viewing was the current record where today that is publicly available. Anybody can see that. But what you just clicked on was the first record when we first brought PassiveTotal.org mm -hmm. online back in 2014. And what we can see here is that the information that was previously uh, attributable to us in the organization has now been masked off. Mm -hmm. And it's associated with a private registration, in this case, one in one, which was our registrar at the time. Uh -huh. And so from a who is perspective, you kind of have a balance here. Sometimes there's going to be privacy protection. Sometimes there's not. And sometimes the threat actor might have not had privacy protected when he first purchased the domain, but later on added it on. Yeah. So it's a way to go back and look to see were there any records that were associated with non-privacy protected results that now I can pivot off of and search and find signals. Yeah, so it's funny. It's because uh, we're, we're kind of the opposite case where we've privacy protected and then we opened it up to the web so people could see yeah. that Risk IQ was a legitimate resource behind this website. Now, from an analyst perspective, what I'm interested in is now understanding, well, can I make connections using this information? So I mentioned before that the, the information could be legitimate, like our who is record, mm -hmm. but it could also be illegitimate. In other words, it's been faked. Um, as long as the record uh, contents are unique, then that has the potential to give us connections. So if I go and I run a pivot, maybe on domains at riskiq.com, which is the email address that we've provided. I'm going to do that now. I'm just going to click on it. So okay. It Query. Yeah, so what we can see here is that these are the other domains that have been registered with domains at riskiq.com. And you'll notice here that some of them don't even have the presence of RiskIQ uh, in the domain name of themselves or one of the product names. But we see our tag that we created earlier. Yeah, so we can see our tag there that's showing non-malicious. But what we're also seeing here is it's other infrastructure that seemingly does not appear to be related to RiskIQ, but in reality, using the Whois data set, we can mm -hmm. see that uh, risk IQ actually registered it. Now, what's nice about this is that uh, the who is system being the sort of phone book that it is that tells you information about the uh, actual record itself gives us a couple key indicators from an analyst perspective, mainly how old is the domain? Mm -hmm. And we can see here that we have a current record uh, from April that's listing uh, the website itself. Uh, but we can go back through the history and the who is records essentially gives us the how long the domain's been around. And I think you mentioned this before, but a domain that's been around for an hour is probably more suspect than a domain that's been around for 10 years. Yeah. 
And so when we're looking at a who is record from an analyst view, the questions we might want to ask are, how unique is the email address, the name, the organization, the phone number, and any other details? Does it appear accurate or does it appear spoofed? Even when it's spoofed, does it appear unique enough that uh, it's not going to be frequently occurring? Uh, an example of that might be um, we had some malicious actors that use Marvel characters. You know, Tony Stark, when they were registering uh, their malicious infrastructure, and you would think there's probably many Tony Starks registering domains when in fact there wasn't. And if you were to pivot on that name that they used uh, in the email address, you would find all of the malicious infrastructure that these guys had set up. And so even though they didn't put in real information, we were able to leverage that to our advantage by making the connection. They were consistent. Yeah. Now, uh, the other thing that you want to see here um, and you want to take note of, we mentioned this on the DNS tab, but again, seeing the name servers that are associated with this Whois record. Again, the DNS tab itself is, is going to have typically the most recent records, but there's times when the who is rec uh, name servers may differ. They may change over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that uh, if you're looking at the who is record, that you're paying attention to the name servers and identifying if they appear to be highly unique as well. Now, are you pivoting off of those to get the hosts that are associated with those to see if there's any infrastructure that's being shared between those name servers? Yeah, like that would be something that I would consider doing. Um, in this particular case, being that they're on AWS, um, there's probably a significant amount of overlap that's not related to us. However, if you look at the subdomain, which we just spoke about, you can see that the subdomain itself appears to have some sort of unique pattern. Mm -hmm. And so maybe Amazon is actually setting up that they have a, a core set of primary domains for Route 53 and their, their DNS service. Mm -hmm. And then they're including a subdomain that might be tied to each particular customer. Uh, so, in fact, if we did pivot on those, we might find some additional infrastructure that we didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do want to recommend here in general is that when exploring who is records, it's easy to skip over uh, pieces of information or ignore certain parts of it. For example, the phone numbers. In this particular case, we have one phone number, but as you're exploring the platform and looking at other infrastructure, you might identify cases where there's three phone numbers associated with the who is record for each of the different sections, the registrant, the administrator, and the technical contact, I strongly encourage that you always explore all of those example, uh, all of those different indicators, just because two phone, on, phone numbers may reveal nothing, but that last phone number might be the reason for the overlap or the, the breakthrough in your investigation. To link to other infrastructure that might be a known bad or something. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's important, the last thing I'll point out with this data set is that we see it evolving. There's been some upcoming regulations uh, for that are protecting privacy and they're obscuring pieces of uh, this data set. And it's unclear how that'll change over time, but we do know that it's likely information that we're finding today and who is may change and may not necessarily be available. Mm -hmm. So until that, uh, that goes away, that'll continue to be available inside of community.riskiq.com um, and we'll be able to continue to make uh, connections but there is the possibility that we could lose this data set going forward. Mm -hmm.